Um, so yeah, I'm going to wave my copy of the book as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm hoping everybody on the call tonight has either ordered a copy or as a result of tonight will order a copy. Um, for me, this is a really auspicious uh, event. Um, as part of our 40th anniversary, what we're doing is marking 40 years of church action on poverty. Um, so some of what the book is um, and some of what we're doing more generally this year is, is marking that, um, celebrating it, um, celebrating some of the achievements of... That's telling me the speaker. <coughs> speaker's not working. Um, people involved in church action on poverty, some of the, uh, the significant projects we've done. Um, but when we were planning both the book and more generally the 40th anniversary, we wanted to not make it a completely backward focusing uh, time. It would be too easy to kind of look back and be a little bit too nostalgic. So there are stories in here about, uh, about the past, but the themes are deliberately chosen because this is what we're wanting to focus on for the next five or 10 years. We're really looking forward uh, as well as looking back. So the themes of dignity, agency and power which uh, is the title of the book. These for us are the key guiding principles for our work. Um, and more generally, I think I'd, I'd be bold enough to say what we think need to be some of the key guiding principles for anybody wanting to tackle poverty in the UK. Um, so that's how the book's uh, framed, uh, exploring each of those three themes. A dignity is about human dignity that poverty in the words of the UN is um, <clears throat> undermines human dignity. Um, and we want to affirm with people struggling against poverty, their human dignity. And that that is absolutely central, not just to what we do, but any initiative that's claiming to tackle poverty should have at front and center, uh, ensuring that people are able to claim their dignity and uh, enjoy their dignity, um, whether that's a local church project through to the design of the benefit system. Um, agency is about people coming together to um, have an influence on the world. Um, and again, I think for us, that's really important that that's people struggling against poverty that have agency, uh, that we recognize uh, in a very countercultural way that people in poverty are actually the best experts in tackling poverty. The insights that come from living with poverty are fundamental to understanding poverty and to coming up with solutions to it. So the agency of people experiencing poverty, again, can be dramatically undermined by poverty and by attitudes to poverty that would say that people in poverty have no agency because they uh, they're too, uh, too ill-informed uh, or at the worst end are stupid and are the result uh, are subjects of their own failings. But we want to assert that actually the agency of people in poverty, again, whether it's through uh, church projects, through community projects, or in terms of designing a benefit system, that they must be front and centre if we're going to tackle poverty. And lastly, power. Uh, something which the church uh, folk uh, that we're part of, church communities, often struggle with. Um, but if we have a vision of a society without poverty, then that requires uh, social change. And social change doesn't come without speaking truth to power and exercising power. Um, and again, in the book, there are many reflections on power. Um, and the positive way in which when people come together and speak powerfully together, um, they can and we can, and we have in the past and we will in the future, uh, be part of transforming unjust structures, uh, which for those of us that are familiar with the four, uh, the marks of mission, um, transforming unjust structures is core to the mission of the church. Um, and speaking truth to power is core to the mission of the church.
So that's a very brief introduction to the themes. Um, I just want to uh, bring in uh, Kathy Galloway, uh, who wrote a forward to the book, to say a few words from her perspective on, on how the book chimes with, with her, as somebody who's accompanied uh, Church Action on Poverty uh, in her many roles over many years. And it's great to have uh, Kathy with us this evening. So if I can find Kathy, I will highlight the two. So Kathy, what what are your thoughts on on the book? Thank you. Well, I have my copy of the book here, um, and it, it it's a great book, and uh, it. I was just remembering that when I was growing up uh, in many people in my area and indeed all over Scotland ran something called a menage or as they say in Glasgow a menage um, and, and these were run by women in their homes and it meant putting a small amount each week into a shared fund and then each woman in turn got the whole amount for that week and it was often used by people to save for Christmas perhaps or special purposes buying um, new clothes or um, things for the children um, and it brought a bit of extra assistance in times of hardship uh, and it, it, gave, it gave rise in Scotland to a particularly cutting insult which was said of somebody you wanted to say was particularly incompetent her, she couldn't run a menage, uh, and people will not be surprised that it's a common insult in Scotland these days uh, when uh, applied to our Prime Minister. Him, he couldn't run a menage. <laughs> and the menage was a kind of earlier version of, of CAP's self-reliant groups. And these were the kind of groups and organisations like trade unions, friendly societies, cooperatives, credit unions, that have a long history in the UK of people organising together. And they've always been about friends and neighbours and workmates and colleagues, communities, uh, getting together and creating space to share problems, uh, to support each other and to find their own very practical and immediate solutions in the face of hardship. And in a way they emphasised uh, that, that unity is strength. And they understood hardship about not having enough to get by, living on the knife edge between coping and not coping. There's a line in the song by the Scottish singer Karine Polwart that says, hardship is a limit, not a failing. Um, and I think that's a really important reminder because there's been a very unpleasant narrative, particularly in recent years, that has tried to paint hardship, not as a limit, but as a failing, to blame the poor for their poverty and put it down to any manner of garbage, actually, <laughs> inability to budget properly or laziness or too many children or lack of initiative, uh, and really just to uh, not face up to the fact that it's really about lack of money. <laughs> uh, and of course, blaming the victim has always been a number one tactic of abusers. And this really is, uh, I consider, profound abuse. And it deflects attention away from the self-interest of those who profit from the ongoing war on the poor. And it, again, it really is a war on the poor. Uh, and the tactic overlooks the fact that people living in financial hardship pay more for everything on infinitely less money, uh, more on energy and food and domestic goods. And the, the economy of our country and most of the world is designed to protect the security, the wealth, the property and the assets of the comfortably off. And even churches, in my opinion, too often see poverty as a problem of the poor rather than a problem for the poor. They see their job as to fix the people 
not the unjust systems that create the hardship. And that's why I think this is a great book because it spells out its message very clearly, as I think CAP has always done since its beginnings and in all the ways in which uh, I've uh, worked with them and alongside them. And I think it's a, a kind of threefold message. And first it says, we resist this definition of us as a moral problem and our lives as dispensable and of little value. We know our people and we know that we are precious and that Jesus walks among us. And secondly, it says, we persist in using our creativity and our hard work and our care for each other to get us through the most difficult times and under the most difficult circumstances, we push at the limits. And thirdly, it says, we insist on the human right to speak and to be heard, to have our experiences taken into account. And also on the right sometimes to fail and be miserable and sometimes to have great successes and celebrating and, and celebrate them because that's what it means to be human. And I hope that many people will read and learn from this book and from the work and experience and love that it represents. Uh, and it, you know, it's a book about dignity, agency and power. Uh, and so I think it's about resisting and persisting and insisting. Uh, and I, uh, uh, you know, go on yourselves. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Thanks uh, so much. Back to Liam. Uh, yeah, just before we, we move on to having some readings and, and uh, sort of tasters of the book, I think Neil Painter from Wild Goose is here, who who was the one who invited us to come up with an idea for a book and has, and has uh, published it uh, for us. So uh, I think Neil might like to say a couple of words just before we start. So can I hand over to Neil if he's here? Um, hi, uh, thanks hi, Liam. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, great. Um, well, uh, Wild Goose Publications is the publishing house of the Iona community and um, I'll just read a little bit from the blurb of George McLeod's biography. George, George McLeod, you probably a lot, a lot of you folk know that he was the founder of the Iona community. So born just before the start of the 20th century into a famous ecclesiastical dynasty, George McLeod became disturbed by his increasing awareness of two nations, the rich and the poor, while working as a young minister in Edinburgh during the 1920s. Disillusioned by post-World War, post War I rhetoric about a land fit for heroes, he shocked his many admirers by taking a post as a minister in Govan, a poor and depressed area of Glasgow. In 1938, feeling that a radical move was necessary to meet the needs of the times, McLeod embarked on an imaginative venture of rebuilding part of the ancient abbey on the Isle of Iona. He utilized the skills of unemployed craftsmen and persuaded training ministers to work as laborers. Out of this was born the Iona community, which over the years um, trained clergy for work in deprived areas and um, worked on issues like world hunger and um, wider social issues. So, uh, you know, for me, the, 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 uh, the roots of the Iona community are about um, concern for poverty and um, members have been working in that area, um, you know, since the beginning and continue to. Um, the Iona community has a common concern networks and one of those um, common concerns is poverty and inequality. Um, and that's a common part of the common concern network. Um, and, you know, several folk are, uh, from the community are in the book, uh, well, Kathy, of course, um, uh, the leader of the Iowa community, Ruth Harvey, um, Ursula Klanecki, um, who, um, you know, worked uh, or worked in the Edinburgh in a grass market project, um, uh, Jan Such Pickard on Mall, Jimmy Calhoun um, over in the States, who um, with his partner Julianne had, uh, is involved in uh, bridging the gap, which is an amazing um, 
um, uh, place, and maybe he'll tell you about that later. So uh, for me, it was, you know, connecting up with uh, Cap to do a book was um, a natural thing. Um, and I thought, you know, the community, Wild Goose and Cap working together would, you know, those two, three things would be good to help uh, get the message out. Um, so, um, yeah, and, you know, personally, um, my background before um, I worked for Wild Goose was working in homeless shelters. So um, I have a, um, you know, personal feeling about it. Um, I really like the way CAP works. Um, um, and um, I really wanted a book that included voices that you don't often hear. So those are some of the reasons why um, uh, we published the book. Thanks so much, Neil. Um, so um, the oh, sorry, um, no. the uh, the book uh, is is split into three sections: dignity, agency, and power. And within each section, there are subsections. And we always start a section with a section we call grounding, which is stories of people's lived experience of the issues and of um, working to change things and working for justice. So to give you a taste of what happens in that section, we've got um, Steph Benstead is going to share her story. She's one of the people whose stories are featured in it. And Gav Aitchison, our media coordinator, is going to uh, help, is going to tell that story with her in the, as a conversation. So I'm going to hand over to Gav and Steph now, if that's okay. Thanks, Liam. Hi, everybody. I, shall, uh, I too shall wave my copy of the book. It seems to be the redundant thing for speakers. I am... Um, Nice to see some familiar faces and some new people as well tonight. Um, Steph, I'll, I'm going to let you do most of the talking here. You, uh, in your chapter of the book, you talk about um, your, your own book, Second Class Citizens, and also about your time as part of Manchester Property Truth Commission. So I wonder if you could just tell everybody a bit more about those. Sure. So I think both of them really stem from a similar issue which is that quite often a lot of the policies and the decisions that are being made are made by people who don't really have enough information so it'll be people who have expertise as a professional but they don't have expertise by experience and they're quite often not listening to people with the expertise by experience and the result is often a lot of policies that actually are harmful rather than helping. So, for example, when you look at universal credit being introduced, there are principles that are a good idea. So it's good that you no longer have this strange system of claiming benefits, and then you can claim benefits and work a bit, but then if you work too much, you lose all of your benefits, and then if you work enough again, you might get tax credits. That was all quite complicated, so it was good to simplify that. But on the other hand, the policymakers didn't really think about, well, firstly, the fact that they just weren't giving people enough money, um, which is quite a crucial issue, um, that paying people monthly was difficult. If there wasn't enough money coming in, it's harder to manage if it comes in monthly compared to fortnightly, or the way that they, if you're in a couple, your benefit is all lumped together and you're treated as one unit that doesn't really work for a lot of people. Partly it means that, you know, if your partner doesn't meet their conditions then your benefits stop. If you're just entering or just leaving a relationship, it gets complicated. There's just a whole load of areas. And that's just universal credit, like just the whole of the welfare system doesn't work because the policymakers don't listen to people in poverty. And the reason I ended up writing my book, which is, this one, Second Class Citizens, um, was because I had a background in disability from my own illness and I'd gone into research looking at it because I became ill around the time of the Welfare Reform Act. So it was very clear that the government was causing a lot of harm. But at the same time, I had lots of friends because I'm from a sort of more conservative evangelical Christian background. So a lot of my friends were voting conservative and yet I knew they cared about poverty because I could talk with them and they sounded like they cared. They just thought that the Welfare Reform Act was 
good and I was sitting there going just just no it's not it's awful please understand it's awful and think about that next time there's a general election so I basically wrote the book with them in mind um to say to them look this is how the social security system is functioning right now and it's a disaster and it's a disaster because there's so many issues from neoliberal economics which just misunderstands how economies work to benefits that assume people are malingering and work shy rather than recognizing that people have a strong work ethic when you have a misunderstanding of the issues you don't design good policy um, so I wrote the book to explain what the issues are, particularly for disabled people. Um, and then the Poverty Truth Commission is similar. It's again saying, look, but on a more local level rather than the national level, it's going, look, when the councils make decisions on ha what happens if someone's in council tax arrears or when the police have to arrest a youth who's been troublesome recently or when the GP is trying to deal with a patient who doesn't seem to be cooperating with what the GP thinks should happen. Now, what is it that's actually going on? You know, what what impact are these policies that the professionals are putting in place actually having on people? Because what a lot of the professionals didn't realise until you get into something like the commission is just how harmful some of their policies are. So the commissions get people, usually around 15 people who are in poverty, with 15 people in senior decision-making positions within, say, the council, the NHS, the police, local employers, and so on. And you bring them together and you have repeated conversations about poverty and about our lives to get to the point where you've got those relationships where you can actually make some recommendations that work. And it is really interesting to see, because like, like I said earlier, a lot of these people really care. They want to do right. So they're really distressed when they discover they've been doing wrong but they they are willing to change but you've got to get the people with the lived experience into the room with the people who are making the decisions because that's the only way you can get good policy thank you steph um and on on this week then on the on the anthology it's obviously called dignity agency power and we've been asking everybody who's contributed to the book or his order copies to um, reflect and consider what those words and ideas mean to them. So what, what are your own thoughts? What do, what do those ideas mean to you in your life? I think the dignity is about firstly having enough to live off. So you're not scrambling for money. You're not constantly going, can I afford to have the heating on? Can I afford to turn the light on? Can I afford to eat this food or do I need to save it for tomorrow but it's also a bit more than that it's about having enough to participate in society it's about being able to have a friend come over and not feel ashamed that your house is cold or that you haven't got any milk to offer them in a cup of tea or that you can't even boil a cup of tea it's about if you've got children knowing that sometimes you can actually buy them whatever the latest fad is and they're not constantly excluded by always having the value brands and equivalents, but that sometimes they can actually enjoy the same things that their peers have. And it's about being able to help your friends and your neighbours and being able to have that reciprocity, that friendship, that relationship. So it's not that you're always taking because you're always the one in need, but that at least some of the time you've got something to give to someone else and it's also about just the long-term security that you know that you'll be okay if something goes wrong which is what we haven't really got because the social security system doesn't work if you become ill or if you lose your job or if a partner becomes ill then things aren't okay um, and I think dignity is about having that in part, it's about having that confidence that you can look to the future and go, actually, there are systems in place that will help me stay on my feet if something goes wrong. And agency is sort of that control that you have over your life, your ability to direct where it goes and make choices. So that it's like if you're applying for a job, you're not just stuck taking the first job that comes up, however awful it is, because actually there's multiple options available to you. You pick the one that works for you. 
or it's about being able to choose what subjects you want to take at school or even which school you go to, what GP you see, which hospital you go to. And it's about having that ability to control where your life goes. And I think a lot of what people at the bottom face is you don't have that agency because you're constantly being, if you're on unemployment benefits, you're constantly being told by the government, you've got to do this many hours of work search. This is how you have to do it. This is how many jobs you have to apply for. Your work coach will tell you, you have to apply for this job. You have to go to this interview. You have to go on this course. And there's no trust that says, actually, you can choose for yourself how you're going to prepare for work. You can choose yourself to go and do some volunteering that might actually help you. You can choose yourself to turn down this job because it's not many hours and it's really far away and it'd be better to wait for a better job and you don't have that agency where you get to be part of the conversation of what happens in your life and then the power I think is about having the impact on the world around you so if agency is partly about having impact on your own life power is going actually I can make changes in society as well whether it's just my local community I might be a governor on the local primary school I might be in a residence association I might be part of a religious or political organization or I'm just someone that if I go to the police or the council or health and social care and say look there's this issue they'll take me seriously and they'll listen and they'll do something about it and they'll involve me in the decision making process and we don't really have a lot of, of that at the moment you tend to have people you've got the professionals and they make the decisions and then you've got the people who are affected and they don't get to make the decisions and it there is there's a lack of power and in general the more money you have the more power you have and that really doesn't lead to a country that works for everyone yeah, thank you very much um just finally before we move on what are your uh, what are your hopes for this week then for the anthology what do you hope that people who read it take away from it and what what might come of it I think there's just there's so many hopes that you can have, but I the what I wanted to say was that because I'm from that evangelical conservative background, I think what I'd really love is to see my sort of church groupings reading this book and getting from the the poems just that emotional impact of what it's like to be in poverty, that loss of dignity, of agency, of power. Because when you have that emotional impact, that's that tends to drive change in a way that just having the head knowledge doesn't. And I'd like to see them when they do some of the sort of look, looking at scripture, looking at stories that they're often really familiar with and getting a new understanding of them so that they can start to take seriously the command of God that we all pursue justice for the poor and oppressed. And I'd like to see those Christians really take that command of God seriously and have their hearts changed by the, the stories and the messages from this book. That's great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steph. It's been a pleasure chatting. I'll pass back to Liam. Thank you. Thank you very much both. That's great. Uh, I'm going to just try and just deal with the technical stuff. Uh, there we go. Um, I'll spotlight myself alongside Chris. Here we go. Oh, hang on. To... Hello, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's on next. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening here. So... There we go. Here we go. I've got Chris. Oh, that's that's oh, working. There we go. Hi, so um, this is Chris Housen. Chris is the chaplain at Sunderland University and manages the Victor Jara Liberation Theology Library and an annual Liberation Theology Gathering. So, uh, and we were very lucky because Chris happened to be on sabbatical while we were putting the book together. So we took advantage of that and roped him in and got him working on, on, on the book with us. And we were a big benefit to us. And there are two big sections of a, each of the chapters of the book has a section on praying and a section on thinking. So there's lots of prayers and materials for worship and there's Bible studies and reflections. Uh, and we were pleased to get Chris on board because we didn't want to have the usual approach that you might see in, um, 
in books and resources to, to how, how we read the Bible and how it's presented and, and how we think about those things. Even in really good resources like Wild Goose, sometimes it, they can fall into some of these pitfalls. So, Chris, would you like to say a little bit about what was different, what we wanted to do differently when we started thinking about Bible study for the book? Talk about well, that a bit for us. Well, first of all, can I thank you, Liam, uh, for inviting me in and, and Neil, because I, I love working on the book. For me, it's a, a thing of joy. It's, it's come out much better than I anticipated. It's really good. I, I've loved it. I'm um, working with the organisations, really uh, wonderful. For, for me, as a, as, a, as a liberation theologian, you know, it's... Um, the UK can be a pretty pretty grim place to be, to be honest. Um, you know, we're celebrating 40 years, but it it ain't much to celebrate. 40 years ago, Thatcher was in full swing. You know, the the Falklands War was being fought. Nationalism, populism were were being brought in to to embed neoliberalism in its fullness. And and you know, church action poverty has gone alongside this period of terrible neoliberalism, which has left you know, huge gaps between rich and poor. And, you know, we've gone through a, a terrible time in a, in a pandemic in which there are now more billionaires in the UK than were before a pandemic. You can see this sort of this stretching society between those who have and do well and those who don't. And, and church action and poverty has been, for me, a stronger voice than the Catholic Church, than the Church of England, my own tradition it's been a stronger voice in challenging that than any other voice in the UK at this time so to, I was thrilled to be part of it because I think it's 40 years of as Kathy Galloway said resistance to all that's gone on that has driven down people's lives made lives people's lives a, a misery and so you know it is a pleasure to be part of it but also a real joy because I got to travel. Um, we got to travel around the UK visiting people doing some cutting edge stuff to see Kate in Withenshaw and all the folk in uh, Everton and around Liverpool working on the pantry system. And we would have gone to a, a few more in Sheffield and various places, but unfortunately the pandemic made it a little bit harder to see that. But it was amazing to realise that throughout the country, you know, from the tip of Scotland down to the southwest, there are people desperate to make the gospel respond to the problems and the and the, the issues that we're facing today um so yeah absolutely brilliant we wanted and the other thing we did was of course we had these mass gatherings on uh, on zoom zoom's very nice egalitarian thing mass gatherings where we got to you know meet your judas and the seths and the ursulas and and ruth and jimmy and all those folk doing incredible stuff in different parts of the world different parts of the uk and bringing us together to say how can we lift voices because the job the great thing about liberation theology and the great thing about church action poverty is that desire to lift voices so that we can resist so we can say this stuff is wrong this stuff is not biblical this stuff is not of god and resisting it so i think that's what we that's what we were trying to do i think um we were at the start of the conversation about the view, it was nice to be challenged by some of the ideas you brought. You we, you talked about the gospel in Salentinama, and then we we tried to 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 learn from that approach in liberation theology when we went out and and read the Bible with people in Everton and Wivenshaw. Do you do you want to say a bit? Have you got any other stories you'd like to share from the, the experiences we had doing that? Well, that, well, I, I remember uh, yeah, vividly when we were in Everton and um, we were looking at the story of the the, the lost sheep and we we mistold it deliberately and as if Jesus you know wouldn't bother with the lost sheep and would and would really just care about the ones that were, were you know the ninety nine and uh, and and someone who you know never read the Bible at all in, in a life and it was it just come along to this thing wondering what was going to just say that's just terrible that's just awful you know that's not how it is that's not how it should be and you know, really got to the grips of the understanding of that Bible story without ever having uh, you know opened a Bible before in a life and uh, and hearing that voice and retelling those stories and here are just beautiful moments because you know people get the injustices of it they recognize it and 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 I can't believe that we uh, go to churches where this incredible gospel that empowers people that puts people with disabilities put people uh, women put people who are marginalized puts different uh, religion samaritans people who are different from us center stage and says listen to them i can't believe that we're in churches that have that and that are failing 
to really lift those voices in their churches. And it, it, if there's one thing I did kind of want to say, which was kind of maybe challenging in the book, is that, you know, we, you know, even churches that are trying to tackle injustices in their community, recognizing that poverty is out there and want to do something about it, they still fall into chap as it the, the trouble if you go into their worship, if you go to their meetings, they follow those hierarchies, they follow some of those inequalities in, in their whole pattern of who they are. And so we need to look at places where people have broken away from that. The Gospel of Solomon's and Army is a great example, but the owner community has been doing this well in many different ways. And parts of the country are really pushing those boundaries. But we need to be listening to those voices where we're trying to actually get back to those gospel stories and how Jesus was trying to liberate people and make sure that people on the margins were put center stage again so i think that's what we went to listen to some of those voices and that there are loads that it, it happens naturally it's the holy spirit at work it's still out there um but the churches as a whole i don't think quite get it and church action and poverty needs to keep being a voice for that and um, would that be what you'd hope for from the book is there anything else like the same question we asked to steph what, what would you hope we can achieve with a book like this well we hope it that that, that it that it um is read and it's quite it's got lots of fun things in it it's, the poetry is lovely and the stories are nice and succinct i think it, it it tells a lot of those things it's a little bit about passing on the knowledge the knowledge of people who live on poverty but also the people who've been working around these issues for years you know, 40 years of, ch of church action poverty i think it's passing on some of those nuggets of resistance to others and giving people the tools to encourage them to do it you know i'm, I'm, I'm the, one of the best things that happened to me liam over the last uh, 10 years of being involved in the worship collective with you lot and and just spending time with people who are trying to draw out those liberating messages and share them with people and encourage people to hear them i think that excites me and uh, and challenges challenges me every time but also i'm really grateful that you allowed me to share a screen with you because when it's just my big head i forgot to trim my nasal hair and that would be really worrying for me um, and also, thank you, Cathy Galloway, because I thought when they said that thing about menage, I thought they meant the Prime Minister Boris Johnson couldn't organise a menage a trois. I didn't understand the conference, but now, now, now I get the context. I'm a very happy man. Thank you. Anything else, Liam? Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Read the book. It's fantastic. Get it out there. And you know, it's a great thing. Also, it's, just, it's in nice chunks that people can use it over Christmas, can use it over Easter. Um, there's a lovely liturgy for, from, for Pancake Day in there as well. So, um, you, know, you know, it can be used in little chunks throughout the year. And I think your know, churches need that. It's quite hard to do big, big things, but these are very manageable. Well done. Thank you, Liam. Thanks, Chris. Um... Uh, hang on, I'm just sorry. Um, I'm just checking. I was about to hand over to Matt Sowerby, but I don't know if he's actually here. Matt, if you're here, can you unmute and shout? Because I've, I've got a big list of sixty odd people, and I can't find you on it. Oh, that's a shame. I think Matt hasn't been able to join us. I know. For some reason, that some of the email invitations haven't gone out that I was supposed to, were supposed to gone out automatically. So maybe he's one of the people who got missed. Um, so uh, what I was going to ask Matt to talk about was uh, the the last of the kind of sections of the book. Each of the chapters includes a section of writing, which is poetry and prayers and other creative materials. And Matt was our poet in digital residence during lockdown. And he ran some brilliant workshops for us with uh, people who are interested in creative writing and poetry. And I was hoping he'd come and talk a bit about how poetry can be activism and the importance of voice and how poetry can be a way for people to tell their stories and raise their voices. Um, so I'm sorry Matt's not here. Um, he would have said some brilliant stuff about that, but instead I'm going to hand over to a few of the poets to read out their poems and hopefully you'll, you'll see in practice what that means anyway. So, um, first of all, um, we have a poem by Miriam McCarty, and Miriam has very helpfully made a short video of the, the poem, which is called Free Women's Voices, a poem and a prayer, really, this one. So, hopefully, if I can share my screen, I'm going to play the, that, that for you first. Uh, there we go.
I saw him first from a distance. I had heard about him, how he could heal people if he wanted to. I wasn't sure if he would heal me. He was in the house ahead of me. Surrounded by the men of the town, all talking and pushing to be near him. He didn't see me at first. He was sitting on the well edge when I arrived. All the other women had gone by then. I wasn't welcome when they were there. He asked me for a drink of water. I never thought he would speak to me. There's no easy way to say this. I bled all the time, 12 years and counting. No one wanted to come near me. I felt unclean. There's no easy way to say this. They didn't want me there. Pushing myself into places and situations usually restricted to men. I felt unwelcome. There's no easy way to say this. I had a reputation, living with a man not my husband, and so many before him. I felt ashamed. I just wanted to have control of my life again, to feel comfortable in public, not to be worrying about what others thought of me or what I thought of myself. I just wanted my voice to be heard, to be allowed to take my place in society to use my voice and play my part. I just wanted to feel normal again, respectable even, to hold my head up in the street, to be part of my community again. It doesn't seem too much to ask, yet we were invisible. Ignored and unregarded. Our presence undesirable, our voices unheard. Until, until he came. came. Do you know what it feels like to have someone know your story alongside me in my troubles when I reached out my hand. Do you know what it feels like to be fully acknowledged, recognised for all that I offered and all I might become? Do you know what it feels like to have someone accept you, to know the very worst of you and to love you just the same? I never thought I would have the courage to ask for what I needed. I reached out and touched him. I believed and I was healed. I was tired of staying silent, not voicing my beliefs. I poured out my oil and declared him Messiah. I had become so used to staying out of the way, unwanted and unwelcome. I believed he would accept me. I offered my hospitality. His presence beside us. Listening to us, believing in us. Enabling and empowering us to stand in our dignity. To, to be, be all, all that, that we could, could be. be. Um, and that next, I've got, I'd like to invite Amanda Button uh, to read a poem. Amanda works with ATD Fourth World. It's one of the organisations that we're in partnership with. We do various things together. Uh, and Amanda shared this poem uh, as part of the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty a couple of years ago and very kindly gave permission for it to be included in the book. So I'm going to hand over to Amanda now. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's working. Be brilliant. Um, yeah. 
like Liam was saying, this is a poem that I wrote two years ago. Um, it's called To Restore One's Soul. To restore one's soul is to have a sense of pride in what you do, to take back control over your own image, to be positive about yourself, your self-respect, your self-worth in everything that you do. If poverty gets you down and humiliated to the extent that you feel ashamed or judged for how you look, how you talk, or how you are perceived by others, because poverty can just quite simply fry your brain. Then stop for a while, take time out, and just go out and reconnect and be at one with nature. For me, I am an animal lover. So I reconnect by being close to my dog and go horse riding. It gives me back my pride, self-esteem, self-worth, and most importantly, my dignity too. To believe in someone is to also give them back their dignity too, their self-respect, honour, human, humanity, and it feeds their soul. I am what is known as a renegade because I have a backbone and I am prepared to stand up for what is right and just. I will not be silenced nor will I cower down to the powers that be, nor will I be downtrodden underfoot like a piece of dirt that they have just stepped in. They can criticize me all they want for the way I look or the way I speak. Quite frankly, I don't care. My strength is in my self-belief for I know in myself what matters to me. That is my self-respect and my dignity. My positive power is to stand up and be counted, not only for myself, but on the behalf of others. And I can also be their voice too, because I have the courage to be able to say enough is enough. I am not going to, nor am I prepared to, take it anymore. So to the powers that be, take notice of me, sit up and listen to my voice and heed the words that I am saying to you because I am not a number nor am I a commodity that you can just push from pillar to post or pick up and drop again when it suits you. Because after all is said and done, I'm a person, I'm a human being just like you because I have a voice too. I will stand up and be counted. You will not silence me, nor will I go away. I am here to stay and I will have my say. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Amanda. Um, next, uh, I'd like to invite Liz Delafield, um, who's written a few prayers and poems in the book, and there's a piece called Interrupting Prayer. Liz, do you have someone lined up to help you with this, or do you want, uh, do you need any help with this? No, it's all right. He's, um, Stuart's here with me, so he's going to do the prayer with me. Wow. Thank you. We who have plenty pray for those who have little. Excuse me, what if I don't have plenty? Well, we are praying for you. Aren't I allowed to do the praying then? Of course. But you, you just said... Okay, point taken. Maybe we should just pray together for more equal sharing in the world. Better, but it's no good praying for it if we're not prepared 
to work for it too. What should we say then? Let's pray and work together, whether we have plenty or little, for a more equal sharing in the world. Amen. Great, thank you both. Uh, uh, so next uh, I'd like to invite Kate Brumby, who's going to read one of the poems that she's got in the book. Uh, let me just see if I can... All I've, I've and I'm very impressed by your background, Kate. Thank you. I thought you'd appreciate it, Liam. Where you've been... Um, so I invite you to enter one of the stories in, that we've looked at in the book. The story of Jesus and the money changes appears in all four Gospels, and I've titled this poem, Turning the Tables. I was watching when he entered. I saw most of what he saw too. Those that eagerly welcomed, the widow coming into view. Her last coin and hope taken, nothing more she had to give. Yet they, the money handlers, cared not how she'd now live. His position struck me hard. Watching Jesus, I was gripped. In opposition, he stood still. Ultimate control being his. Then movement quick and exact, tables tipped and cash strewn, impact on all present there as his actions turned the room. I watched there in silence. I had no words, nothing to say, until I saw him look at me. Then I knew only one way. His glance was all I needed to know his questioning. Was I like the money dealers? Or would I like to be as him? I faltered only a moment, just enough time to think and realise he was bidding me to go and follow him. No further hesitation then. I knew where and what to do to help bring about justice and to seek to fairness ensue. The challenge I accepted and I wonder if others do. I'm on the side of Jesus. Listener, how about you? Thank you, Kate. Uh, great. Next, um, I'd like to invite Brian Ford to read a poem for us, please. Hi, Brian. Right, hello, can you hear me? Oh, hang on. Right, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear is everyone, yeah, I'm seeing nods. Right, um, in the New Testament, we read of Jesus healing a blind beggar called Bartimaeus in Jericho. Bartimaeus simply means son of Timaeus or son of Timothy or son of Tim. So this is old Tim's blind kid. None of us knew his real name, if he had one, he was just old Tim's blind kid, sitting at the roadside, just outside the city, begging all day, every day. Part of the scenery, really. Nobody objected. We're a fair-minded lot here. If visitors want to drop him a few coins, that's okay with us. But when the miracle man and his mates arrived, the beggar started shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me drawing attention to himself, really embarrassing. We're respectable here. We wouldn't want a crowd of visitors to think we're a town full of beggars and ne'er-do-wells. We kept telling him to shut up. I think someone actually kicked him. Cruel, but understandable. But Jesus stopped, called for him, asked him what he wanted. Do you know what he said? I want to see. What a nerve. Asking for a few coins or a piece of bread, fair enough, but asking for his sight back, that's not on. Everyone knows disability is a punishment for sin. We believe in justice here and correct doctrine. But Jesus healed him. He's got no sense of what's right and proper. Now we'll all be invaded by every beggar between here and Jerusalem. I'm told Jesus doesn't tend to hang around. We'll be left with the problem. Uh, 
Thank you, Brian. Uh, we've got a couple more poems before we wrap up. Uh, from Nick Waterfield, I think. Let me see if I can find you. There we are. Yes, here I am. Hello, Nick. Uh, yeah, if you could, you've got a poem, I think, to read. Uh, yes, I've, I've got to find it. <laughs> Do you have any idea what page it's on? Should know by now, having proofread this thing. Um, um, I know it's in the first section, but I... Nick, is it the one on page 74? Page, sorry? There's one by you on page 74. 74, let me... Thanks, Gav. I think that's... That's right, no words. Page. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, this poem, kind of the context of this is... So I wrote this pain, I wrote this story, this poem in the, in the height of the pandemic. We'd actually had a, a one of our... One of our community um, had just lost her mum to COVID, um, and and she was really angry because it was that time when no one could visit, and you know she just lost her mum and hadn't, hadn't been there for her and all those kind of things. So she was really broken hearted and really angry and all the rest of it. And, and so we we chatted a little bit on online, and and eventually I kind of got to this poem, which isn't just about that, but it kind of expresses some of that as well. It's called No Words. No words can stop the tide of tears, mend the broken hearts, or end the unconsolable pain. No words can explain how or why some lives are apparently valued over others, or why we get what we don't deserve. No words, no words, no words. So let quiet fall. Let the sobbing and crying be heard. Let tears tell the stories and wounds and scars make noise. Soon there will be time again for words, but for now, listen. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, and we've got I'm sorry, we're, we're maybe going to run about five minutes over. I'm sorry if, if that's, uh, uh, that's a problem for anyone. But uh, I've got a, one more poem and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I think Andrew Pratt. Uh, yeah, Andrew, if you could share one of your poem, please. Are you hearing yeah. me? Okay. <laughs> Sound me through? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a nod, but not hearing it. Yeah, OK, I heard you. Um, I've had a, a capacity I've discovered to write very, very quickly. And thanks back to Matt, who was mentioned at the beginning of this section. Um, in one of his workshops, I wrote what is to follow. And the background to this is um, a sense of complicity. I look at churches and I see them not well, saying that they are supporting the poor, but looking very rich in themselves. And then I'm conscious that I am complicit because I'm certainly not poor. Manipulated by power, selfish, it or me. They call it church. And they name him Jesus. Barefoot in the dust, naked to a cross, shorn of humanity. We tell the story, draped in robes, losing step with the prophet. Claimed to emulate his body, yet lacking immolation. Devoid of scars of confrontation, allied to injustice for the sake of comfort. They say that this is evidence of grace, the gift of God. Avoiding mirrors that picture complicity, hypocrisy. And so I kneel while drawing in the sun, fondling stones. Thank you, Andrew. 
and thanks to everyone who's spoken uh, and shared their poems. Uh, I'm just going to. Um, I'm going to invite Neil back on to um, uh, Neil. Um, I'm going to share my screen with, with the details of what you're going to talk about and how people can buy the book, and then hand over to you. So I'll just give one moment. Here we go. Now, while Lynn's doing that, I just want to yeah, thank everybody who's contributed tonight and everybody who's contributed to the, the book. Um, at the back of the book, there's a list of contributors, and I haven't had time to go through. There must be 20, 30, 40 contributors um, in a book of 200 pages. So um, it's a great book. We've, we've given you a few glints to what's in it uh, this evening. There's a huge amount more. Um, there's the stories which um, staff touched on. Um, there's the stories of people struggling against poverty themselves. There's the stories of our campaigning work and programs over the years. There's the poetry, there's worship resources, um, uh, prayers and um, Bible study. So a huge amount we've managed to pack into small book and you can order it uh, through the Iona Books uh, website, the link's there, um, and that will be fantastic. Uh, if you're high tech enough, you can uh, use the QR code that's on the screen now. Uh, the book costs uh, 14 pounds or £15, I'm not sure which, and I'm not sure, to be frank, what a penny difference makes. It's very good value, and uh, please don't just buy the book for yourself, but recommend it to others. Uh, put it on uh, Christmas lists and uh, anybody that's involved in preparing worship, uh, recommend it to them as well. Um, so please do join uh, to buy the book. Um, secondly, um, I mentioned this is our 40th anniversary year and on the 5th of July, Liam's just put the details up because I was struggling for the date, 7pm on the 5th of July, we've got our 40th anniversary service live from Iona Abbey uh, on the Isle of Iona. Several of us will be there for the week um, and the Iona community are very um, being very gracious in enabling us to host our 40th anniversary service uh, from the Abbey. It'll be streamed live on Zoom. So if you want to join us, uh, it's probably more practical to join us on Zoom than to try and get to Iona, uh, but you can do that again by um, following the link there to the 40th anniversary service um, on eventbrite.co.uk. Um, if you don't follow that, then go to our website and um, you'll find details there. And again, there's a QR code. Um, they, these are just two things for our 40th anniversary. We've got a, a whole range of other pilgrimage events around the country. And we also do have a fundraising appeal uh, to support the work of building a social movement. Our, our big vision and goal for the next 10 years is to build a social movement to reclaim dignity, agency and power together. Um, and that's hard work. And I can guarantee you that that's uh, not an easy task. So every penny you're able to give to support the 40th anniversary appeal will enable us to build that social movement to work with people to reclaim dignity agency and power together and in the world that we're living in now that chris touched on earlier uh, there could be nothing more important than to ensure that people are able to live lives with dignity agency and power so thank you all for coming and have a good evening and see you um at the 40th anniversary service or any of the other events that we're having over the next uh, few months. So I hope you enjoy tonight. Thanks so much to Liam for uh, hosting and coordinating the evening and for doing the immense job of pulling the whole book together. Um, so thank you all. <laughs>